close till I get up. Time is barely on our side. I don't want to waste what's left. The storms we chase are leading us. And love is all we'll ever trust. Yeah. No, I don't want to waste what's left. And I
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Processed Animal Proteins in Swine Feeds Past, Present, and Future uh, panel. We are live here this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you're at throughout the globe, and we want to welcome you um, to this great discussion that we're about to have. Processed animal proteins have a long history of use in swine diets and other species as well. Of course, it's not a history without some problems. Everyone in animal agriculture agriculture will remember or have read about BSC scares and the regulations and focus on biosecurity that followed. More recently, the swine industry has come under pressure from corporations and sometimes consumer groups who have brought new viewpoints in an effort by meat processors to differentiate from their competitors. We've seen a proliferation of, of all vegetable fed, free range or pasture raised, antibiotic free and more labels which has brought some decline to the use of processed animal proteins within swine feeds. The trend seems to be waning though, with recognition that processed animal proteins can play an important role in animal health and welfare, along with promoting sustainability. So what does the future hold? Well, that's what our panel's here to discuss today. I'd like to introduce three esteemed panelists today. Our first is Dr. Yan Ben Shin. Before joining APC, Dr. Shin held key roles at Cargill stateside including Global Swine Technology Lead and Innovation Leader, overseeing swine feed and nutrition research and development. He earned his bachelor's and master, master's degrees from the China Agriculture University with a focus on animal science and feed technology. And he earned his PhD in swine nutrition from North Carolina State University, where his research centered on tryptophan and methionine utilization for pigs and broilers. Our second panelist is Dr. Sun Wu Kim, a PhD graduate of the University of Illinois in 1999. He's a distinguished figure in the field of monogastric nutrition. As a professor of nutrition at North Carolina State University, his research program is internationally acclaimed for its groundbreaking contributions to intestinal health, amino acid nutrition, and functional nutritionists or functional nutrients in monogastric animals. He is a dedicated contributor to the animal science community serving as the associate editor for prominent journals, including the Journal, journal of Animal Science, Animal Bioscience, and others. Dr. Kim's research has garnered over $12 million in grant funding, leading to the education and mentorships of numerous graduate students and researchers. Recognized with prestigious awards, including the AFIA Award in Non-Ruminant Nutrition Research and the Vernon Young International Award for Amino Acid Research. Dr. Kim's influence does not only extend stateside, but globally as well. He was named the University Faculty Scholar uh, by the Chancellor of North Carolina State in 2013. 
Last but not least, I'd like to introduce our third panelist, Leonardo Hackenhar. Uh, Leonardo is a renowned expert in the field of agriculture and animal nutrition with an impressive educational background. He holds a degree in agronomy um, from Brazil and has a master's in animal nutrition from the same institution. Leandro has made significant impact in the industry as the global technology leader in global strategic marketing and technology at Cargill Nutrition and Health. Furthermore, Leandro serves as the director of Brazilian College of Animal Nutrition. His extensive career includes research contributions at the Center of Advanced Research in Agriculture Economics at ESLQ um, slash USP as well as valuable experience with leading companies in animal nutrition and additives, such as DSM, Torti uh, Tor uh, Tortiga, uh, Ajinomoto, Avonic, um, and Agroceras. We are honored to have um, Leandro as a panelist today and look forward to gaining insights from him. All right, now that introductions are over, I wanna introduce our audience and I wanna extend a warm welcome to all those joining us for this webinar today. Thank you for your attendance time and trust. Please don't hesitate to engage and participate as actively as you'd like. I'm certain that questions will arise during the discussions, so I encourage you to leave a comment in our chat section. I will be keeping track of it as our uh, webinar um, is ongoing and we'll make sure that your questions uh, get addressed um, throughout the panel today. With that, let's get started. All right, first question. Let's delve into the topic of how animal proteins are used globally. Each of you has extensive experience working with producers of all sizes and shapes across the globe, right? How have animal proteins traditionally been used? So let's start with a history lesson first. And then how has that changed over time? So how has that evolved and how are we currently using them? Uh, Leandro, I want to put you first on the spot. Let's start with you. How have animal proteins traditionally been used and how is their use currently being used today? So first of all, uh, thank you very much for APC for this opportunity. And thanks for everybody that is watching us and uh, participating in this debate, yeah, this conversation. This is a very interesting topic because we know all the changes in the market and trends around the world. However, animal proteins uh, has been utilized widely around the world as a good tool to improve performance and to reduce costs. So this is a, a, a really good tool on that things. And it's a very good, no, noble way to use these proteins. Yeah, we are reusing them for producing animal protein. So it's a very noble, noble use of that. Uh, we know that are some challenges. We need to respect uh, uh, the different uh, views of customers and everything. But at the same time, we need to know that the technology to produce good animal uh, proteins for using feed has in, have improved. Yeah, so we have not only better uh, nutrient quality, but we also have more and more tools that helps to guarantee the, um, the security of these uh, ingredients. So that's why I, I, I see it is something that we'll keep learning, keep using. There are so many other tools also to manage the variability of these ingredients. Uh, first of all, we see a reduction this variability because of better technology of their production. But at the other side, we have much more technology to control the quality of it. Let's say, for example, NIR. So we can really help and take the best of these ingredients in, in swine nutrition. So I think this is some considerations. So, Dr. Kim, what would your addition be to that? Okay, uh, first of all, it's very, very exciting to be here. Um, if I can mention about this uh, earlier time, I'm talking about probably 1990s or 2000. Uh, it was very typical to see uh, fish meal added to nursery feed at around 5% normally. Uh, blood plasma all the time, three to three to five percent. I don't know how Yenbin will say, but especially in early winter feed, 
because we can see those new living pigs will eat better for sure and then grow better with animal proteins. And you can see those differences visually without weighing anything, uh, measuring anything. So that, that's my experience. So uh, in uh, feeding nursery pigs, we, we have been always using the animal protein. That's even today I do that. But recently, uh, due to maybe several reasons that Leandro mentioned also, but we will talk about that later as well. I see uh, less animal proteins or even no animal proteins being used in some nursery feeds. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, I've also been working with uh, processing some plant protein uh, supplement. I see some good things and some uh, issues as well. So uh, it, that's what I see in these days. Uh, is that the plant protein good enough or uh, should have animal protein? So that's my comment. Sure, and Jan Ben, you're opening comments to our first question here this morning. Sure, yeah. You know, I uh, appreciate those comments from uh, Lian Zhu and Zhang Wu uh, on this topic. Uh, the way I look at it is, uh, uh, you know, at, at APC, we do animal protein and we have customers globally, right? And what we saw over the years is uh, you have different reactions, uh, you know, different perspectives uh, among different regions. Um, when we look at the, the big picture, um, you know, we look at it globally, we, we, we can uh, categorize the regions into four different regions, right? North America, Europe, Asia Pacific and Latin America. Each region has very unique uh, view about uh, uh, the current status of uh, processed item protein and the futures. You know, give your a few comments on each region. Regions, uh, for example, North America. Historically, we have used a lot of processed animal protein in either swine diet or poultry diet, even in, in dairy uh, uh, dairy diet too, right? Because of large availability of the byproduct from animal agricultural productions. Um, but uh, starting from 10 to 15 years ago, uh, there's some trend uh, initiated by the poultry producer, um, basically looking at uh, different differentiation in their food label, right? Uh, developing, you know, animal protein free, um, you know, chicken meat or vegetarian fed uh, chicken meat. Um, so that has been a trend um, for the last 10 to 15 years on the poultry side. That has created some interesting uh, trend as well on the swine side as well. Uh, we, we have seen some packers want to claim animal protein free or vegetarian fed uh, pork product as well. Um, so of course, Uh, the swine disease we have experienced here in the North American, like PEDV, um, and there's also the, the safety percep perceptions on animal protein as well. Um, one thing I would mention on the poultry side is uh, uh, over the last 10 to 15 years in North America, uh, the growth of vegetarian fed uh, uh, poultry has grown, but until last year. Uh, so now we're seeing a reversion revise of that uh, full label, uh, primarily because uh, the welfare concerns and, uh, um, you know, just to understand what the consumers uh, really wanted, uh, whether do they want uh, that vegetarian fed label or not. We can, we'll have a discussion later on this topic, uh, uh, but that's a general view of North America. If you look at Europe, uh, Europe are on a very different uh, path, uh, I would argue. Europe uh, had, you know, if you are, if we can argue, um, Europe had the strongest regulation on animal protein, right? After the BSE uh, scare uh, 30 years ago, Europe had really stepped, stepped, stepped up in their regulation, passed a lot of laws to banning use of uh, uh, processed animal protein in the animal diet. But over the last 30 years, uh, there has been Quite a quite a bit of uh, uh, new law passed to uh, give exemptions of different uh, ingredient uh, being uh, so that uh, those ingredients can be used back in animal diet, right? Uh, for example, fish meal. Now you can use fish meal in young ruminant diet, and blood product is exempt in Europe uh, to be used in swine uh, and, and poultry diet. Hydrolyzed animal protein can be used in ruminant diet too. So. 
Europe, um, they initially had a big restriction. Now, over the years, uh, they are reopening the process and protein, primarily because of the view of uh, uh, circular economy and the sustainability side of the, uh, the equation, right? Um, we, if we can recycle, reuse, um, fully use uh, the byproduct from animal production, it can um, help uh, the sustainability cause uh, in Europe. Um, if you look at the Asia Pacific, um, on the ruminant side, it largely followed the European law. You know, if you look at the South Korean and Japan, China, on the ruminant side, they largely uh, followed the European law on ruminant feed ban. Uh, but on the swine poultry side, uh, animal protein has been widely used over the years because that region historically a lack of a good quality uh, protein ingredient, right? Uh, you know, we, uh, you know, for example, China import maybe you know uh, 100 million tons of uh, uh, you know a large amount of soybean meal from the states, and also the processed animal protein from from the U.S. and from other places to fulfill their protein needs. So historically, processed animal protein has been used there quite a bit. Latin America is more similar to the U.S. because of large availability and, and a lower lower cost of the process uh, processed animal protein. It has been widely used in the Latin American uh, as well. So, you know, in summary, you know, different region has different views. You have some maybe North America and Europe right now have a very conflicted views of where we're going to go with processed animal protein. Uh, but the bottom line is, you know, if, if the product provides value to a producer, I would argue we should look at a way to utilize it more efficiently. Yeah, thanks for those opening comments, Young Ben. And yeah, I would agree. I think a lot of people, especially stateside, might not realize that if a program gets in place, you know, through a producer, everyone that, you know, might use that toll mill might be impacted, right? So if one producer, say on the poultry side, you know, has to follow, you know, an all veg pro program, then any other poultry producer or swine producer um, that may use that feed mill as its feed source also has to follow those same standards indirectly as well. So it can have a ripple effect even beyond uh, just the product that you may see with that direct label or that direct program as well. So let's transition on. So we've kind of set the table here, given a bit of a history lesson in where animal proteins are currently being used and how they're currently being used. What are the pros and cons? Uh, Dr. Kim, uh, what are the advantages to using animal proteins and, and what are some of the setbacks that we should consider uh, within our swine feeding programs? Right, I'm the first. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, it is rather easy uh, for me to comment on this. Uh, I'll just talk about the basics here. Uh, animal proteins, uh, as you know, have, have long been used in feeding young pigs uh, as they need a highly digestible feedstuff with a high quality amino acid profile, which means high in uh, limiting amino acids. However, uh, it, should, it should not have anti-nutritional and also we know now the allergenic protein, which are bad for the young pigs, their intestine, um, which are typically found in the plant proteins. So uh, I can have good examples of animal proteins, such as uh, blood plasma and fish meal. Uh, more recently, uh, we know a uh, very specific bioactive compound in some uh, of these animal proteins with uh, health benefiting properties in relation to immune function, uh, in the intestine and also at the whole body level. And, and this, this can add additional value to uh, this feedstuff uh, rather than just uh, as a source of nutrients. I think that's an exciting thing. And also it is clear uh, that young pigs will uh, grow faster and more efficiently by eating feed with the animal protein that we know compared with the uh, entire plant proteins. So if you are talking about efficiency, uh, I, for me, I would continue, for sure, continue using animal proteins in my nursery feeds. Um, but I know, well, uh, people will say, uh, my neighbor will say, okay, it will increase the feed cost in front. So, uh, but uh, I think if we can reduce mortality and morbidity from uh, situations such as enteric disease, and Yambi was mentioning about that as well, and if we can keep uh, nursery pigs healthy, I think uh, this initial cost will be covered. Um, 
So that's what I feel. Um, I'm not a I'm not a act, actual the producer at this moment, but okay, that's my opinion. And other than blood plasma and fish meal, uh, of course there are other excellent uh, animal proteins. If I can include like proteins from uh, milk product, so it is from animal, so such as whey protein that we know. Uh, but also there is a kind of uh, something like cheese powder, which is a byproduct from uh, food industry. Um, some of these called milk product uh, from the food industry can be probably rather more affordable. That's uh, what I see around. And additionally, um, there are some lower cost animal proteins as well, such as poultry meal, which is more largely available in the southern area of the US, and meat meal probably, and also used to be popular hydrolyzed animal protein, like uh, using the intestine or viscera. Uh, they have a bit lower digestibility with a probably less ideal amino acid profile compared with uh, a higher quality animal protein. But also they may have some concern with uh, some specific compound or contaminants from processing. But we know about those, we know how to handle them. But still, still they are good, uh, high quality protein supplements. Uh, now, if I if I talk about some of disadvantages of using animal proteins, uh, surely, um, I mean there are. I think there are some concerns. Uh, I'm sure most nutritionists will say uh, it's too expensive. Um, at the university, we get very good deal anyway, so we use it anyway. But uh, in production, when the profit is low. I think uh, will be a challenge. Uh, I think uh, you can mention that and uh, Leandro can mention about it. But um, depending on, probably depending on situation of each production unit. And also uh, as much mentioned in the previous question, uh, animal proteins have received uh, criticism uh, for its potential risk in probably in safety in the past. Now I hear that in like Europe there, they're reopening. Uh, releasing the restriction, uh, but uh, those are probably related to the concern with the uh, animal diseases. But uh, with the science, we can prove if that's real or not. Uh, if, you can, if you are based on science, probably we can make a good decision. I'm sure uh, Dr. Shen will handle this topic uh, soon as well. Okay. Yeah, that's going to be my very next question because because I think you know that that's probably the biggest question. Um, that some of our um, audience has. But just real quickly before we get there, uh, Leandro, do you have any comments in terms of adding to the pros and cons of using the animal proteins within swine diets? I, for sure, Professor Kim covered very well the, the topic. Uh, what I think we need to be clear that we have a, some animal proteins that will increase cost, but they have a very good benefit on performance yeah but we also have some other animal proteins that can help us to reduce cost and keep or even sometimes increase performance so this is the balance we need to use the knowledge all the the the, the knowledge we have in all these proteins to increase cost and get the benefits of better performance or to use them to reduce formulation costs but the most important is to have good knowledge of them. There's many publications, many experience around it. We need to have good control of the composition of many of them. Some products are very stable, like uh, animal plasma, but we have some others that are not as stable. We need to control it. And the most important thing I do believe nowadays is to trust on the biosecurity. This is uh, a very important topic. It's a, a, a work that need to be done together with the suppliers to understand the process, to understand the chain, and to have the confidence that you are using something that is really going to help you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jan Ben, anything to share before we, we get to the question in terms of biosafety? And uh, I think uh, Professor Kim and the angel summarized everything perfectly. I would add maybe one thing on the benefit side, uh, or re-emphasize one thing on the on the Sorry, benefit Trey, side. Did you ask me uh, there's some issues on uh, the internet? No, I think we're good, Leandro. 
<clears throat> Go ahead, Jan Ben. So one thing on the benefits, it's uh, the circular uh, economy or sustainability side. We, mm -hmm. as a producer, have to be able to use fully the, the byproduct from our process. And, uh, you know, that will contribute to a good cause. Um, yeah, that'll be my comment. Yeah, I just say the other thing to highlight, too, is we learn more about the health nutrition interaction and how, you know, animal proteins may come into play with some of, you know, these prescription nutrition uh, type formulations that we're trying to key in, whether that be, you know, overcome a respiratory challenge or overcome an enteric challenge, right, on specific health statuses of flows uh, within our production systems. You know, animal proteins can play a key role um, into some of those decisions and formulations. So I, I'd add that as a pro or at least highlight that as well. So Jan Ben is, is a production nutritionist that works with a lot of veterinarians, both inside and outside of my system. One of the biggest questions I get asked when, you know, incorporating animal proteins in, in its swine diet and specifically about that health nutrition interaction is what is the biosafety of this, of these type of products and how do we ensure that we're not, you know, increasing our risk of, you know, any contamination um, from feed, you know, to pigs. So Jan Ben, in your experience, uh, both, you know, pre-APC and now with APC, uh, what can you share with our audience on what is the actual risk and are there ways that we can overcome it? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, you know, I worked at a feed, feed company, right, per, per APC and now working in an ingredient company um, and I've served quite a bit of uh, independent producers and, and integrators uh, from my experiences. Uh, I think one thing is very clear. Every everybody in this uh, um, animal agricultural production has the same goal, which is prevent disease transmission, right? We have the same goal. Ingredient company, feed company, or production company, we all have the same goal to minimize, reduce uh, the disease transmission, maintain healthy herd. So on that side, uh, we are 100% aligned with uh, uh, our, our producers. Now, if you look at the risk, right? I mean, everything has a risk, right? Uh, everything going to the farm may potentially have a risk. Um, ingredient, uh, uh, supplies, uh, even the veterinarian visiting the farm may have a, a have a risk. So we have to look at all those factors uh, holistically, and we have to uh, maybe quantify uh, the risk, uh, the risk profile, so that we can decide which one has the, which are the big leg which are the smaller issues we, 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 we can worry about, right? I think uh, there's a good, good, very, really good uh, publication uh, published about uh, in 2020 by NC State, uh, the Veneering School, looking at, you know, if you look at the PERS transmissions and PDV transmissions in the uh, Carolina regions from, uh, you know, three integrated production system, what are the big risk factors associated with virus, virus infections? The conclusion from that study was very clear. It's a local local transmission, it's the pig movement, the vehicles, the vehicle transmitting pigs to, to farm, and the vehicles are transmitting feed. Those are the, those are the, the key factors uh, uh, contributing to uh, potential uh, disease transmissions. They also evaluated the feed and also processed animal protein in, in those three big integrated system. What they found is um, the feed itself actually represented very, very low risk uh, transmitting uh, disease. You know, if you think about this, it actually make a lot of sense because the feed is generally, uh, you know, the ingredient, uh, animal ingredients are treated, right? And also the feed, uh, uh, you have holding time and processing and uh, the feed itself, it's, uh, it's, it's safe uh, from that uh, publication. Um, you know, if you look at a different ingredient, right? Different ingredient may have a different risk of profiles. Again, we need to have a way to quantify uh, the risk of profiles. Um, because of that, we actually uh, did some work with University of Minnesota, the vast school over there, try to quantify uh, what is the risk profile of our product processed uh, you know, porcine plasma in terms in terms of uh, transmitting different rate of disease, considering uh, our um, uh, process parameters, right? We have multiple hurdles, um, strategies in place, different kill steps in, in the process. How does uh, those kill steps uh, 
translated into uh, you know reducing uh, uh, reducing risk. But we did that pro program with University of Minnesota. Uh, we hope we can publish that paper next year. Uh, but the bottom line from that risk analysis is uh, the, the you know a good manufacturing process with multiple hurdles really minimize the risk of disease transmission, including ASF and PERS and PDV, all sort of uh, viruses uh, that are of concern for uh, for producers. Another uh, publication I would mention over here uh, in this podcast is uh, uh, EFSA, European Food uh, uh, Safety Agency, published a paper last year about different ingredient its risk profile in terms of uh, potential transmission of African swine fever virus in Europe. Uh, the conclusion, the basic conclusion from the risk assessment is the feed itself represents a very, very low, ri uh, small risk in terms of the production system. But among uh, uh, the feed and feed ingredient, um, the bigger risk is actually with bulk ingredient um, a veget vegetable, uh, freshly harvested vegetable ingredient, because those are not treated uh, versus treated processed uh, uh, proteins. Um, you know, um, if you look at, you know, I was reading recently, Dr. D from Pipestone recently published a paper suggesting PERS can also be transmitted by, by, uh, 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 by feed. Um, where he discovered the purse transmission with a cessation feed. Um, you know, if you look at the publication, the gestation feed is mainly uh, vegetable feed, uh, feed ingredient, right? Um, the discovery of that feed can also transmit, uh, you know, PERS make me think, you know, again, um, the bulk unprocessed protein may have some risk uh, uh, as well. So. I guess in, in general, we have to be able to quantify the risk and have a reasonable discussion um, instead of using perceptions. Um, um, we have now have tools from Minnesota, from FSAS to look at that. And we, I think we, we should use some of those tools to, to evaluate different ingredients. Yeah, Th thanks, Young. Ben, appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Kim, any additions or anything like that to uh, Dr. Shin's comments? Yeah, I'm. Jen Bin made a very good comments and uh, very thorough. So I, I can still make very short. <laughs> uh, I agree. It is about how how ingredient is processed, handled, and quality checked, and and those are very important and should be very transparent that uh, the consumer, the user, should know about those. And I think the science would tell if uh, any anything in. Uh, in the protein supplement, uh, any metabolites in there will be really uh, causing uh, the problem to pigs or even uh, the human in consuming that pork or not. I think. But as a nutritionist, um, I, I can proudly say, proudly say that we are capable of evaluating feedstuff for their potential risk from toxic contaminants. Um, we know a lot more than before, <laughs> and also anti-nutritional compound uh, um, for their impact on at the intestinal level. Uh, we can uh, show uh, how they will affect the uh, enterocyte, uh, how the enterocyte will be recognizing those toxic compound or anti-nutritional compound or some bacterial uh, invasions. And also, we can um, evaluate intestinal immune cell reaction as very common in, in nutrition area already and inflammation and oxidative damages and mucosal damages. So uh, we are talking about uh, pig nutrition, but I can say that uh, we, we, we know uh, a lot more and we know how to evaluate those uh, the, the toxic compounds and so on. And I think uh, in terms of the question related to uh, some um, contamination with the virus and bacteria, maybe it's a little outside of uh, our hand, but a pathologist can can handle this. So that's what I can mention, sure. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, and I, I just think, you know, once again, it comes back to just understanding that, you know, those, those ingredients, right, have to be contaminated first, right? So when we talk about animal proteins, right, those, those kill steps that are in place and those, those qualities um, before it's leaving the door, right, then it's the risk of any cross-contamination, you know, as it's leaving the facility. And then as it's, you know, heading to that particular feed mill or, or that, 
you know, manufacturing plant, et cetera, right? So, so same with like corn, right? Corn doesn't inherently have PDV, right? There has to be can't contamination first with organic material um, to allow that occur, right? So mm -hmm. as long as we keep that in mind and, and think about that through the scientific process, through that lens, um, it can allow us to determine what the risk is and how do we overcome that risk, whether that's using a, a feed mitigant or, you know, further processing at our own facilities or whether that's including or not including those specific ingredients, right? So yeah, really appreciate your comments, guys. Leandra, we're gonna to pivot to you, right? So uh, the pork economy has not been a great economy, especially stateside. And as we look at some of the global you know, economic charts, it, it hasn't been a very pretty picture either for a lot of our foreign colleagues as well. Um, so with that, Leandro, you know, how does using animal you know, proteins within swine diets? And one of our questions was, are there any specific um, processed animal proteins that can provide a good return on investment, even though uh, times may be tough for a lot of pork producers around the globe. Uh, Leandro, let's start with you on your comments. Um, you know, what what one or two, um, you know, animal proteins would you suggest provide a good return over investment in today's economic climate? So, uh, I as you mentioned, uh, the, the complexity of the markets are quite high and depending on the moment of the region, uh, the situation is different. I think always the point is to have the right balance between investment and benefits. So sometimes, and especially when you talk about young animals, yeah, to have a cheap feed yeah, does not help to have a cheaper piglet. Yeah, so we, uh, we sometimes we'll save some money with feed, but we'll at end to, to the lack of performance, we have going to have a more expensive piglet end because some health issues, uh, low performance and so on. So what, what I really do believe it's we should not put too much focus on the cost of the feed, but the benefit that the feed is bringing for the production. And sometimes we need to look beyond the face. Yeah, okay, I'm feeding a nursery pig, but sometimes, and many times I'd say, the benefits in the nursery, they you can catch them at the end of the slaughterhouse. So this is a very important to take in account yeah? and not only look at the cost of feed. Uh, I would say it's very hard to, to mention uh, what is the best protein, what to bring the best benefit. This is really depends from the, the region. But uh, what I say, it's very important to have real data. I know my formulation. I know the performance. So let's look the overall benefit. Yeah, Is the cost the main issue? No, the benefit is the most important. Yeah, and these farmers need to be capable to measure and to see it. Sometimes it's really worth to the benefits of health and everything else to have a little bit more investment in our feed, especially when we talk about piglets. In the other phases, uh, uh, sometimes it's worth to use a cheaper uh, animal source uh, protein yeah, poultry meal and some others, when you have good knowledge about the origin, the quality, they can be really helpful to help us in situations where feed cost whether or their uh, profitability of the business is not good. So a summary is let's focus on the benefit, not as much in the cost. Yeah, and, and Leandro, you hit on a really good point there that you know, there's been tons of data on processed animal proteins throughout the years. These these are not new products per se, right? There's numerous publications and numerous commercial data sets from across the globe that says, here's the consistent response, whether that's intake, growth, feed conversion, mortality, morbidity, you know, medication costs, et cetera. That's, that's a known consistent return, right? Um, so those decisions are a lot easier to make or economically pencil out, even though the times are tough versus that something that doesn't have as a consistent of response or, you know, may, maybe, you know, it happens one out of every four times or one out of every five times versus, you know, something like processed animal proteins where, where it's been so well researched that, you know, we, we have a, a pretty predictable response and pretty consistent response once we validate it. 
on, on what type of products you know uh, can have. Um, so with that, um, Jan Ben, just uh, just one more thing. Andrew. Yep. Yeah, I do believe it's very important to have good control, to have data. Yeah, mm -hmm. we need to take decisions based on data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that will tell us if I make investment, do I have return? Do I don't have return? This is a business. Yeah, we need to have good data. Yes, I, I would. I would add uh, one point over here to uh, to the Androids. We know for every business, more regulation, whether that's that's from you know government imposed a regulation or self regulation. More regulation always is bad for business drive up the cost, right? Um, you know, I would argue, you know, you can do a, a, or producer itself can do a cost and benefit analysis by themselves. But, you know, if you establish a, establish a regulation preventing you use a certain type of feed ingredient, it will drive up your cost over time because you cannot have the opportunity to take advantage of that, uh, you know, maybe the fluctuation of, the, of different uh, uh, the pricing of the different ingredients. So, uh, you know, give your example the fat, right? You know, if you can use animal fat today, uh, you probably are saving saving money. But if you have to be all veg, you it's going to drive out drive out your cost. Correct, correct. Yeah, Jan Ben, let let's stay with you here and let's transition just a little bit, right? So we were talking about regulations just a bit ago, right? So we have everything from Prop Twelve. Um, to, you know, the question uh, that may be, you know, passed in Massachusetts. And we were talking earlier about, you know, labels or programs. Um, so how does animal protein specifically uh, fit in within this larger debate about, you know, consumer preferences or, you know, packer demands or, you know, in this case, you know, states basically enforcing uh, animal welfare regulations, right? So is animal proteins is it's kind of on the sidelines and then within quote unquote that that game um how do you think the animal proteins fits in today with consumer demands and then how do we balance that with animal welfare needs that's a great question that's well you know that's what producers are facing today and we have to look into the future as well right future consumers too um i think the first thing the most important thing is actually try to really understand what consumers really want right and and uh, as a production company, we don't uh, get to talk to consumers every day, right? We have uh, our own priorities. And, you know, for give you an example of Prop 12, uh, uh, you know, we can argue it's not good for uh, the animal welfare, but, you know, a large part of consumer want to have a better welfare um, um, practice. We cannot fight against uh, the, the trend. Uh, but you know, coming back, we have to understand what the consumers want, right? Um, there's a there's a good publication uh, last year on a food ethics um, uh, journal looking at the different food labels, and they want to understand what are the labels, what are the characters on the food label that are important for consumers when they are making the purchasing decision. Quite interestingly to me, you know, no antibiotics, no hormones and natural label are the most important uh, for the consumers when they're making the, the produce. So, you know, if you're a producer, I think you should probably be thinking about producing product without those uh, added uh, antibiotic or hormones because that's where the consumer is, 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 uh, is gonna pay their uh, money on. In terms of <clears throat> animal protein or vegetarian fat diet, that that um, uh, study also look at this uh, full label as well. You know, quite surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly to me, it's uh, it actually ranked the lowest on the full label. So the bottom line from there, it's uh, you know, there's only maybe eight percent of the consumers are saying this uh, vegetarian fat the label it's it's important uh, to them. It's almost equals to the percentage percentage of the consumer are vegetarian. So, um, you know, the bottom line from there is this is a, the vegetarian fat is not a important label uh, for uh, for consumers. Uh, you know, which brought up a, a very very important point is uh, as a production company, we have to understand what consumers want and we have to align us with them. 
but misalignment or misunderstanding of what consumers want will cost us a lot of money, right? right? If you look at the poultry side, I mentioned earlier, over the last 10 to 15 years, we have a huge increase of the vegetarian fed, the full label on the poultry side. I mean, till last year, it reached to 65 to 70% of the poultry produced in the US had vegetarian fat label, but the consumer really don't pay uh, for that label. Uh, and starting started uh, earlier last year, we saw uh, quite a significant changes on the food label. Now, you know, that vegetarian fat label on the poultry side probably dropped from 60 to 70% to only 25% to, to this year. So quite, uh, quite a big drop. Uh, but if you look at the history, because of that misunderstanding or misalignment, it really cost the poultry producer quite a bit of money or it was a very, very costly exercise for them. I think I would argue on the swine side, we probably want to look deeper and uh, make sure we really understand where the consumer is at before we make those uh, uh, big decisions. Uh, one other thing I would mention, the soy board just, met, just had a, another survey with consumers um, what they want uh, in terms of uh, animal proteins. That survey was just published a couple months ago. It was very aligned with the previous uh, previous study I've mentioned. Consumer want to have uh, um, have their animal protein that are uh, sourced locally, and the animal are humanly humanly uh, raised, and they want the uh, the animals be fed with a, a nutritious diet. Um, which I think a process and protein can play a very important role in there. And the soy board also asked whether animal protein free is important or not to the consumers. It's again, it's a, a reiterate uh, the, the other study, the consumer generally don't um, care about whether they, they have been fed or vegetarian fed or not uh, from that survey as well. So uh, to summarize, uh, we got to understand what consumers at. We have to fulfill those needs, but you know we have to be careful uh, not miss to understand where where uh, the consumer is at. Yeah, no, that that's great points, Yon Ben. I I think you know one thing that you highlighted there really well is is we have to understand you know what our consumers want. So first of all, we have to ask the question, and then second of all, we have to listen. And I always try to be an optimist, right? So I think there's two things that I'm optimistic about. You know, animal proteins in terms of you know, meeting that balance of animal welfare and consumer demand is first of all, the labels that they do care about in terms of those natural type products, having animal proteins incorporated within those feeding programs allow us to be more successful. I think the last thing that our consumer wants is to have increased mortality and morbidity. Um, you know, they just wanna make sure, you know, that their kids and their family are, are eating a safe, nutritious product and that the animals being you know cared for as well as possible right so it's almost counterintuitive that we take away some of the animal proteins if we are trying to be you know have less antibiotics within our within our you know um stockmanship programs um etc the second thing is if you look at the pet food industry specifically dog food some of the most successful marketing campaigns within the dog food industry right now is increased animal proteins right so um you know and not decrease so those are two things that make me optimistic in terms of that question that we were asking. So uh, we're here at uh, at least 1020 central time um, where I'm at. So we got about 10 minutes left here. So I want to give each of our panelists one opportunity to answer this question. Then we'll have some concluding thoughts is I mentioned earlier and maybe a little bit incorrectly uh, that, you know, we know a lot about animal proteins. These these aren't new products. There's numerous publications and in a consistent response, as, as Leandra said, as long as we have, you know, the data behind what, what that ingredient possesses. But there is a lot that we don't know, right? Especially, you know, around the animal nutrition, um, you know, health by nutrition interaction and, and you, know, um, you know, things like that as we can continue to advance science. So I'm gonna start with Dr. Kim and I'm, I'm gonna go around the horn to each of our panelists here. Uh, Dr. Kim, you know, do you have any projects planned around specifically uh, animal protein research and what do you think the future of that research looks like? Yeah, it's very um, exciting area. Uh, we know a lot about uh, protein and amino acid value from the animal protein, but 
uh, we know more about now, uh, there are something more than that. Um, I think uh, evaluating uh, the role of those uh, functional compound, uh, I think those are small peptide or it could be a larger peptide uh, with a unique function that like could be immunoglobulin or some peptide similar to IGF and so on. Uh, knowing their role uh, in addition to uh, just being used as a source of amino acid, they will be uh, they they can open a, a lot more about understanding uh, animal protein. Uh, also, talking about the peptides, um, yeah, we've been working with a uh, soy protein for years. Uh, we are we have used uh, different processing method to hydrolyze soy protein into small peptides, and uh, in order to uh, make uh, them highly digestible. Uh, but we also see some 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 uh, interesting thing and some issues. Some peptide with uh, some uh, unique uh, uh, sequence can cause some uh, interaction with the satiety hormones. And looking at the peptide coming from the animal protein, I think uh, those we we have a lot to understand about the peptide uh, um, when when uh, those proteins are hydrolyzed, part, partly hydrolyzed, and that will open a, a lot more research topics. And that's what I am also interested in these days. Uh, Leandra, what's, you know, some things that maybe Cargill's working on? Uh, one question in her chat was, you know, specifically maybe about, you know, gut microbiota modulation um, in terms of, you know, does using animal proteins uh, help influence overall health? So I'll have you, you know, maybe make some comments on that as well. Well, uh I, I really do believe that today we know that we need to feed two different organisms. Uh, one is the pig and the other one is the microbiome. Yeah, and they have different needs. And uh, this is an area that we are learning a lot. Yeah, and, uh, and we know that to keep the microbiome healthy, it's very important to keep the animal healthy and also to get good performance. Uh, and I think this is an area for the future where we need to keep investing, is to know more about the interactions of animal proteins in microbiome. Uh, this is an area that we are putting some focus, and uh, I think it's good opportunities in the future. Awesome, thank you. Jan Ben, I'll have you close the, this question out anyway. You know, APC is going to continue to, you know, invest in research of, you know, their products. Uh, what are some things that you can share and highlight for us? Yeah, absolutely. I echo what the Leandro and Dr. Kim was saying about in this, uh, in this research area at APC. Um, I think for us uh, on, on the live production side, we want to really put our money or emphasize on um, how do we quantify using animal protein to improve mortality and morbidity values for producers, uh, especially in North America and South America, the producer integrators are getting bigger and bigger. We have better way now to measure mortality and morbid morbidity, morbidity in large system now, right? We want to understand, we want to invest and uh, try to understand you know, what are the actual value we can bring to, uh, to a large protection system. Uh, in terms of health benefit, reducing mortality and morbidity. That's one of the areas of uh, focus. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, the fractionations of, of plasma. Is there any compounds in, in plasma uh, are responsible for for the uh, uh, the majority of the benefit? Uh, and uh, the hydrolyzed product, right? Uh, if we hydrolyze plasma, uh, is there any good peptide that can be really helpful for for the, the health benefit and also for the microbe, uh, uh, microbe population in, in the pigs. And that, that's another area where we'll focus some of our uh, research. Um, a third one, it's not you know kind of research, but it's more about uh, uh, evaluation, right? On the, on, on the PEPF side, uh, we have really heard that the leading PEPF company put a lot of emphasis on the sustainability uh, figures, right? We, as a company, we will research and we will put some dollars on there to understand by circulating uh, <clears throat> the proteins, animal protein, process animal protein back to um, animal production or 
uh, in pet food, uh, what kind of the you know sustainability uh, value are we providing to the whole society? We will do some research on that side as well. So, oh, awesome. Thanks, Young Ben. So I will just ask each of our panelists any concluding thoughts or things that we have not touched on um, throughout our panel so far. Jan Ben, we'll start with you. Yeah, I think uh, we have, you know, today we're living in the age where, um, you know, you have easy access to a lot of information, right? Uh, there is a lot of past publication, newer, newer publications, informations. <clears throat> if you're concerned about using <clears throat> And a protein, or if you wanted to learn more about it, <clears throat> just reach out and uh, and there's there's a lot of information we can have a good debate on. Yeah. Dr. Kim. Yeah, I actually was reading up uh, some questions from the the audience. Uh, uh, there's one question about uh, from uh, Liana about the microbiota modulation in pig in the intestinal microbiota. Uh, I'd like to mention that. Uh, this animal protein, just looking at very basic nutrition by looking at the amino acid profile, very high in essential amino acid, low, lower in uh, non-essential amino acid compared with the other protein supplement um, that you, you, we have to add uh, a lot more uh, amino acid. Uh, if, you, if you use animal protein, one of the benefit is reducing uh, the crude protein in the feed. Um, of course, there are many different ways of doing it. Uh, and, um, we have uh, we have uh, um, many papers, good good uh, science science supporting data showing that uh, reducing crude protein in the feed uh, will will discriminate uh, discourage the growth of proteobacteria in the intestine, which will be related to the in, uh, re reduced in, uh, intestinal inflammation and a healthier bile and so on. Eventually, pigs grow better. So that is another thing that we should uh, understand that uh, uh, animal protein with a high essential amino acid uh, will be a way for the uh, part of the precision feeding or meeting the animal animal welfare probably with intestinal health. Yeah, Ling Andrew, you're concluding. Sorry, I, I could not hear that some hey, issues in internet. No worries, Ling Andrew. Do you have any concluding comments to share with our audience? So, uh, first of all, thanks for all of you to, to join us and to listen. Uh, I say it's use technology. Yeah, let's use uh, information, let's use science, let's use data. Yeah, let's also to show the market what we are doing. Yeah, and to be able to produce better, yeah, healthy uh, uh, fee, uh, feed and healthy food for us to consume and to keep consuming good pork. I think this is my final message. We keep working, keep learning, yeah, but animal uh, products for sure are a very good tool when we know how to use them to increase performance or even sometimes to reduce cost. Yeah, that, that's a great message to end on. Thank you. And thanks to each of our three panelists. I want to thank our audience for tuning in as well. I think we had over 120 people on um, listening here this morning um, or this afternoon around the globe. Um, so on behalf of, of our panelists and myself, and on behalf of the, the WiseNet6 team, I want to extend our sincere thanks um, to all our participants and the dedicated people working behind the scenes as well, behind uh, our, our seminar today um, who contribute uh, to this great content that we listened to this morning. To wrap it up, I just want to say thanks to APC and the Swine It podcast. I uh, hope you listen to future episodes that come out every Tuesday. Um, there'll be a link to our podcast show, uh, which occasionally I uh, host and uh, try to get some good content out um, to our audience on a weekly basis. Uh, there'll be a link for that um, in the chat as well. So until next time, I uh, hope you each have a great rest of your day and enjoy um, a safe and great time uh, with your family and friends during this holiday season. So with that, thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.